Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, first, I'll remind uh, everyone that McGill University is located on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. McGill honors, recognizes, and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we meet today. <laughs> L'Université McGill is on an emplacement that has long time served as a place of rencontre and exchange between the peoples autochtones, y compris les nations Odenechone et Anishinaabe. McGill honor, reconnaît and respects these nations à titre d'intendant traditionnel des terres et de l'eau sur lesquelles nous nous réunissons aujourd'hui. Thank you, Easton and Lomi from the Red Path Museum Society, our student club. They help us out with lots of public events. You might hear them in the kitchen. They're getting ready for the reception after this talk. Our reception, our uh, speaker tonight is standing here. Behind her is a, um, a clipboard that I would like to pass around. If you are interested in receiving more information, please put, give me your name and your email, and I will put you on our recipient list. If you do need to leave at some point before this uh, is finished, please don't walk out this way. Instead, use that exit at the back there. The door is open, and you go straight down, and you'll be at a door that says, don't open this door. Open it, nothing will happen. And you will be out right across from Lee Cox. Okay? That's the best way to exit tonight if you're leaving before we finish. We acknowledge generous support for this monthly series of lectures to Dean David Eidelman, he's the Dean of Medicine, and the Vice Principal of Health Affairs, to Dean Elam Imami from the Faculty of Dentistry, and to the donations to the Heroes of Science Dean's Fund, so that's the Faculty of Science Dean, and to Dean Anya Geitman, she's the Faculty of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at McDonald campuses. Many thanks to TV McGill for the videography of this series the edited videos of these lectures will be platformed on the Red Path Museum YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So we're building a whole channel for our for some of these public events. Not all of them, but certainly all the cutting edge lectures. Um, back door, I told you about that. And that's it. We've done the land acknowledgement. Dr. Lawrence Mizak will now introduce video to our speaker for this evening. OK, thank you, Ingrid. Um, I'll welcome all of you to this uh, second, third last lecture of the series. We're so happy to have Dr. Iyer. Uh, but before I introduce Dr. Iyer, I have two uh, responsibilities. One is to remind you to shut off your cell phones, put them on airplane mode. And number two, uh, I just want to announce next week's lecture because it's somewhat uh, a little unusual in our series. Normally we have uh, speakers from McGill, but next week we're having the Romanovsky Medal Lecture. That's a medal given by the Royal Society annually. And part of the responsibility of receiving that medal is that you have to give public lectures. And there's actually funds provided in an endowment at the Royal Society for the Romanovsky Medal winner to travel and give lectures. <coughs> uh, the lecturer is uh, Keith Heipel. He's a former president of the Academy of Science. And he's an engineer, an environmental engineer, and his talk has already been advertised. So I do welcome you to that special Romanovsky cutting edge lecture. So for that, I may now like to introduce Dr. Vidya Iyer. Um, I actually didn't know her until I sat on a certain committee at McGill. I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, I served on a committee a number of years ago, in fact, still serve on this committee, for the Principal's Prize for Outstanding Emerging Researchers, those 10 years or less from the PhD. And I came across this uh, very fine uh, nomination of Dr. R for this prize. And I was very pleased to see that she was a recipient of this prize. So that's one of her many honors that she has recently received. Uh, Dr. Iyer is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry, but she is also an associate member of the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Occupational Health. And I think she also spends a lot of time as a researcher at the Douglas uh, Mental Health University Institute. She uh, completed her uh, undergraduate and master's studies in psychology in, at the University of Mumbai in India, and then she continued on with further advanced studies at, uh, in Nebraska and California. Uh, 
Vidya's work focuses on youth mental health and early intervention. She seeks to ensure that more young people worldwide have time their access to appropriate mental health care and enjoy well-being and social participation. Vidya partners closely with patients, families, and communities to impact upon real-world practice and policy in Canada and globally. And she's also the scientific clinical director of ACCESS, Open Minds, a pan-Canadian youth mental health network that includes urban, rural, and indigenous communities. As I've mentioned earlier, Svidya Vidya has received many honors, and in 2017, she was inducted into the College of New Scholars, Scientists, and uh, Artists. It's just sort of a junior version of the Royal Society of Canada. No guarantee that you'll become a fellow, but there's always that uh, possibility. Uh, and I just learned uh, from her short bio that she was recently named on the inaugural list of Canadian women leaders in global health. Um, well, I've met you only once briefly before, and I said I really look forward to hearing your lecture, and I say it again tonight. So Thank welcome you. to our series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction, and it gives me great pleasure to be here today. And I must thank the audience, not only that are you here today, you're here on Valentine's Day, so I'm <laughs> going to try and make it worth it. So, um, so before I start, I, I want to apologize for having arrived a bit late, and you know, the, so we're starting a bit late. I'm going to try and make sure that we can keep to the time. Uh, I also just arrived about like less than 48 hours from India, so if I'm jet lagged or suddenly break into Hindi or Tamil, forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm gonna, before I start, you know, the work anyone presents is often the work of many, many people and many supports. So I wanted to thank several funding agencies that have supported my research, uh, especially the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the FRQS, uh, the National Institutes of Health, Grand Challenges Canada, the Networks for Centers of Excellence, uh, and I'll also thank some specific projects I'll acknowledge uh, the funders for those specific projects as well. Uh, I am here presenting on behalf of some projects that I will be talking about. One of them is the Access Open Minds project. It's a very large pan-Canadian network and I wanted to make sure to acknowledge uh, the youth, the families, the various communities and the various investigators that are part of that project. I'm also going to be talking to you very briefly about work that I've been involved in since 2006 uh, in a specialized early intervention program for psychosis and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Uh, so I wanted to thank the patients, families, clinicians and students and researchers there. Um, I have, I'm going to talk to you also about work that I've been involved in in India. Uh, so I want to thank people with whom I've collaborated there since about 2006 now. Uh, and I want to thank my research colleagues uh, at McGill, uh, research colleagues at Warwick, and several students who are here today as well, uh, always sort of the wind beneath my sails. So. Okay, so the plan for, uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes, so, uh, I can I can be loud. Okay. Excellent. And if I do suddenly soften, feel free to say so. So the way I've organized my talk today is I'm going to make because I thought it would be nice for this audience to sort of make a case uh, for why we need to focus on the mental health of young people, including young people with serious mental illnesses. And then I want to sort of talk to you a little bit about some services innovations in mental health and services research, both in Canada uh, and in India, and leave you with some concluding thoughts uh, based on that presentation. So that sort of is the outline for the presentation. Um, so, since it is Valentine's Day, I thought I needed to start somewhere on my slides. Um, so this is a quote by Lord Byron, and I thought it's a really nice, apt quote uh, that sort of talks about youth. So, O oh, talk not to me of a name great in story, the days of our youth are the days of our glory. And the myrtle and ivy of sweet two and twenty are worth all your laurels to ever so plenty. So when you think about youth, it really is a period of much potential and milestones. A lot of what we think is important in life often happens during this period, you know, whether it's like finishing school, pursuing opportunities, <coughs> finding work, finding love, 
um, you know, finding partnerships. So a lot of what is considered, what are considered critical developmental milestones happen in youth. So it's really an important period in most people's lives. I also wanted to mention that, I mean, in general, in most societies, the prosperity of these societies is tied to the well-being of young people, and this is particularly the case for countries, for example, for many low and middle income countries. So India, for instance, where I come from, has more young people than anywhere else in the world. About half of India's population is under the age of 25, uh, and that's like about 600, I mean, I don't even know the numbers anymore, but it's a huge number. We also, 600 million people. Um, when it comes also to Canada, in indigenous, in indigenous communities, a large number, about one third, are under the age of 14. In 2016, for the first time in Canada, we actually had more older people for the rest of Canada, but that's not the case for indigenous communities, where in many cases, 40 to 50 to 60 percent of the population is under the age of 25. So across the globe, in most societies, and in particular groups, youth and their well-being is going to be really, really important predictor of the prosperity of these societies. So a little bit about why we need to, why we need to transform the way youth services are provided. So the first sort of, I'm going to make some really key points here, um, and some, some of you might be familiar with some of these things, and for others this might be new. We know now that about over 75% of mental disorders develop before the age of 25. So really most mental disorders emerge in the period between adolescence and young adulthood. So this is really a critical period. We also know that when it comes to glo the global burden of disease, okay, so when, when you look at the global burden of disease, mental illness is among the top, so in high income countries, it's the top contributor for the disease burden experienced by young people. And when it comes to low and middle income countries, it's the seventh largest contributors, primarily because there are still many such issues like you know, diarrhea, neonatal disorders, malaria, but it still is a significant contributor to the global burden of disease across the globe. We, so this graph here shows you, it's okay if you can't fully see it, it's the global burden of mental and substance use disorders. And what you see over here, the blue represents the disease burden or what we call DALIs or disability adjusted life years. So the years lost, uh, uh, healthy years lost due to disability. And what you see is the blue, which is the burden attributable to mental disorders. And you can clearly see that a disproportionate share of that burden is experienced in youth. Uh, this, this, act, this graph is actually from a very interesting report. Of those of you who are interested, uh, it's a really nice report that was released in September of last year. It's the Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health. It does a very good job of presenting an overall <coughs> global portrait of mental health and the various challenges and sources of innovation in mental health. Uh, so you can see that it's a youth skewed burden. So this next graph here is really a graph that shows across the globe. So these are the different lines represent countries of different economic uh, standing. So you have high income, low income, low middle income. But across the world, there is a rising burden of disease that can be attributed <coughs> to mental and substance use disorders. This does vary with high and high middle income countries sharing a little bit more of that burden, but across the world, what you can see over the last 10 to 20 years, this burden is increasing. When we talk about young people, it is also very, very important uh, to talk about suicide or self-harm. So it's the second leading cause of death among 15 to 29 year olds globally. There's a wide variation in rates though, and this is really important to acknowledge. So worldwide, the global average is about 7.4 per 100,000. But you can see, for instance, in India, the average is much higher. It's 38 per 100,000. And in some parts of India, it goes as high as 150 per 100,000. In Sri Lanka, it's 23.9 per 100,000. So there's a lot of variation in rates. In Canada, you know, I'm sure everyone's been following uh, in the last several years, there have been a lot of crisis reports 
reports of suicide epidemics almost in indigenous communities. So what you can see over here is the difference in the rates uh, with very high rates among young First Nations youth, both males and females, much higher than the rate among non-indigenous Canadian youth. This rate is actually much, much higher among Inuit youth. So Inuit youth in Nunavik, for instance, have the highest rates for suicide and self-harm in the world. So in all of this, what you're not seeing are the rates for uh, non-suicidal uh, self-harm and self-injury. And if you had to include that, the rates are actually much, much higher. So, so on the one hand, we know that this is the period with a risk for onset. We also know that there is a lot of disease burden attributable to mental disorders in this age group. But what do we know about mental health services? So what we know, and this is again more or less a global picture with some sort of exceptions, that most young people what they ex remain untreated or undetected or they face long delays before accessing appropriate care. And to access that care, they actually go through these really complicated pathways or journeys, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. And when they finally do not get, get into a door which opens to some sort of service, it's usually very poor quality, it's not really made uh, for young people, it's disengaging, it's not evidence-informed. So this is sort of the picture globally of <coughs> youth mental health services. A particular problem in this age is also that most health systems are organized such that there is a transition at the age of 16 or 18 between child and adolescent services and adult services. And most people, most young people who are in services or need services do not seem to make it through this transition. So those who are in services before they turn 18 abruptly experience a transition and then have huge gaps in care before they finally get care again, resulting in a lot of suffering and perhaps like an increase often in mental health problems. So this here is a, this was a study done by the World Health Organization where they had 14 countries, um, <coughs> both low and middle income and high income countries. And what I did here was I actually took the data from that uh, to show you visually the treatment gap uh, for serious mental health problems. So what you can see over here is that in, even in high income countries, about 35 to 50, 55 percent of people with serious mental health problems in the past year did not receive services. And when it comes to less developed countries, it goes anywhere from 60 to 90 percent of people with serious mental health problems who do not get care in the previous 12 months. So what we're talking about are huge treatment gaps. So this is another graph. This is more recent. It's 21 countries uh, with about 51,000 people across 21 countries. And it talks about care, minimally adequate care. So we're not talking about high quality, like excellent services. We're talking about what would be considered acceptable care for major depressive disorder. And what you can see is that in high income countries like Canada, it would be about 22% who get that care. And when it comes to middle income and low income countries, the gaps are even higher. Um, so this here is actually a systematic review done uh, by my graduate student who's here in the audience, Kathleen. It, we did a systematic review of several studies uh, looking at sort of what is the journey to care that young people and families experience. So how many steps do they take? What kind of doors do they knock? Uh, do they get the care they get, need right away or is it a much more complicated route or journey to care? So we found 45 studies from 26 countries, so it's quite a, quite a number of studies. But across the board, what we noticed was that the key finding was that most young people and their families experience what we would call very complicated or complex pathways. So, so in a simple way, they basically knocked or had to knock on multiple doors before they got any sort of care. They often experienced huge delays, and these delays can range anywhere from a few weeks to years. The same study that I told you earlier about, the study by the World Health Organization, actually documented delays that ranged usually in years, anywhere from four to five to 23 years 
that most people across the globe experience before they get appropriate care for mental disorders, which was the same case for young people. We also noticed that a lot of young people also go through the emergency room before they access care. Many also go to primary care or their family doctors, but that does not seem to result in appropriate care. So, so on the one hand, many people seem to ask their family doctor for help, but the family doctors seem to have less capacity to identify and to refer them to appropriate services. So what, what we noticed was that this was the case, whether it was high, you know, there were differences between high income and low and middle income country, but the picture was pretty consistent in terms of having multiple stops before you access care. So this is also a slide from, uh, this is actually a slide that represents the actual route. I just thought that it sometimes is much better uh, to look at an actual example. So this is an example of a young person uh, who accessed services uh, at the Prevention and Early Intervention Program for Psychosis in Montreal. So psychosis for, in a very simple way, it's a group of conditions often considered a pretty serious mental health problem. Typically there is a loss of contact with reality, sometimes there are altered perceptions. People sometimes have strong sort of idiosyncratic beliefs that are maladaptive or make it difficult to function. So. It's a, it's a specialized early intervention program, and the emphasis is really on intervening early. So we do a lot that we can to reduce delays and make sure that people are accessing care as early as possible. And this is the route that one person took. And I just thought it really illustrates the kind of uh, convoluted journey that some people experience before getting care. So the first stop, and I'm going to go very quickly through it, the first stop was a school psychologist uh, who clearly was offering some sort of help to this young person, followed by multiple stops at the Montreal Children's Hospital emergency room, followed by stops uh, at the CLSC, which is the primary care service, followed by a couple of stops within the Douglas uh, for outpatient care, and then finally reaching at PEP, which is the appropriate treatment for psychosis in that setting. And this process took from September 2012 to October 2013. This is not typical. People experience somewhat shorter delays when it comes to a serious mental health problem like psychosis. But it still is indicative of the kind of uh, convoluted journeys that many young people experience. So often when I talk to people about treatment delays, there is this perception that the delay is really on the part of the young person or the family member. Uh, so they have to, and when it comes to delays, actually there's a lot more to it than just that delay. <coughs> so if you can think about it, if you're experiencing some sort of a health problem, so the first step is either you or someone in your family has to recognize that there is something off, that, the, that there's a problem here, and that can take some time, and that's the first delay, or what we often call the help-seeking delay, but that doesn't mean as soon as you recognize the need and you knock on the first door that it's the right door. So there's often a delay within the system where so you may go to a school counselor, you may go to your priest, uh, you may go to your family doctor, and they might struggle with figuring out what's the best way to help you. And there's a delay within the system, they might send you to multiple stops before you finally reach, if you're lucky, the destination where you can get the right care. So there's a lot of systemic delay. So there's the help-seeking delay, and there's a systemic delay. And together, they actually constitute what, in the case of psychosis, we call duration of untreated psychosis. But most mental disorders, what we would simply call treatment delay from the onset of the problem to the time that you get appropriate care. And we now know that delay, in addition to causing a lot of suffering for young people and families, it also disrupts their attainment of school, work, and in some cases actually results in more complicated <coughs> illnesses or like more difficulties in terms of outcomes. So this is really a big problem that we are trying to solve in the case of youth mental health services. We, some of the work in this is really trying to understand does everyone experience delays or are there particular groups who are more likely to experience delays. And it certainly seems to be the case that certain groups, maybe ethnic minorities, immigrants, in this case young people who are not in work, school, 
or training. Uh, so this particular paper, what we found was that those young people who were not in work, school, or training experienced about 23% longer delays than those who were in work, school, or training before they got care for something like psychosis. Uh, and often this was more than three months, which is quite long for something as serious as psychosis. So part of the hope here is to try and identify those young people who might need more targeted outreach to make sure that they are matched to appropriate care as soon as possible. I'm going to sort of switch. I've kind of painted a little bit of the picture for why we need to focus on young people and their mental health and why we need better mental health services. And in the next little while, I want to talk to you a little bit about some services innovations both in terms of research and in terms of actual service delivery in Canada and India. So sort of like, yeah, you know, I am a psychologist by training, so I always want to make sure to leave the audience with some hope. Um, so, so some of the work, uh, my own journey in Canada, I think, uh, started with working in the area of early intervention for psychosis and then sort of extending this focus uh, to young people and mental health. Uh, problems among young people in general. So that's sort of, that's the journey that I took. I'm not going to be talking to you a lot about the early intervention for psychosis part, but I wanted to make sure to acknowledge that that is a source of uh, inspiration for a lot of the work in youth mental health. So there are some, because I won't be able to tell you about multiple innovations, over, I would say that there are four key essential elements for high quality early intervention services. Uh, the, the four being, you need services that are continuously transforming or trying to improve, um, improve the service. Okay, so you need to continuously be in the process of transforming the service with the goal of making sure that the patient and family experience is, is smooth, is engaging. So that's the first component. The second component is to do so, you really need to continuously think about building capacity. So building capacity among general practitioners, building capacities among teachers and counselors in the community, among patients, families, clinicians. So a key component is you can't really have transformed services if you're not involved in the process of building capacity. The other component is research. Um, and the important thing here is at least the kind of research that I have been engaged in that is a direct link between research and implementing it in actual real world clinical or community <coughs> settings. So, so you need that link between innovative research and innovative services and they, they need to continuously feed each other. And then the last and perhaps so almost like a foundation for this is you need multiple people, uh, particularly patients and families, but also community members, clinicians, decision makers, policy makers. You need multiple people to be engaged and part of the dialogue if you really want some of this innovation to quickly translate into practice and policy. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about one, uh, about the Access Open Minds project. It's a project. Um, so the Access Open Minds <coughs> project is funded under what is called the Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research. Uh, it's jointly funded by the Canadian Institutes for Health Research and the Graham Beck Foundation. You see Ian here. Thank you for being here. Uh, and it's a five-year project that was funded in 2014. Uh, we're probably going to go till 2021. And I'll tell you a little bit about this project because it is similar to many other international initiatives, but there are some particular particularities because of the Canadian context. So what is this project? It's a large pan-Canadian initiative, and the goal of the project is really to sort of transform the way in which young people between the ages of 11 and 25 uh, access services and the way the services are delivered to them and evaluate whether this transformation works. So what does that actually mean? Um, what we're doing is we're working in 14 sites uh, in very diverse Canadian contexts. And in choosing these sites, we really wanted to mirror the kind of diversity that exists in Canada in terms of geography, in terms of resources, in terms of youth populations. So we have sites in urban contexts like Montreal and Edmonton. We have semi-urban and rural contexts like New Brunswick and Chapin, Kent, Ontario. We have several indigenous and remote 
communities, we also have some special population sites, like homeless uh, youth in Montreal in collaboration with Donna Roo that many of you might be aware of. We have a university site in the University of Alberta. So what we're doing is working with these communities to transform the way they deliver mental health services. So what does this transformation look like? Because these sites are so diverse, what we identified was not really like a cookie cutter approach which everyone had to follow, but more core principles that each community had to come together to execute. So what were those principles? The first one is early identification with the idea that we need to make sure that we're doing something so that more young people in need are accessing services. The second step was that once they access services, that the door that they approach is quick, it opens quickly, so they don't experience the kind of long, complicated pathway that I showed you, but that this is something really short, direct, friendly, engaging, not through the emergency room, but in a nice, youth-friendly community space. So that's the second step. We have a 72-hour benchmark, which for those of you who know the Canadian healthcare system is pretty remarkable and miraculous. <laughs> the next step is that they are matched to appropriate care, the kind of care they need uh, within 30 days, which is the benchmark set by the Canadian Psychiatric Association, that there is no abrupt age-based transition. So they get services for as long as they need up to the age of 25. And the last sort of principle is more, is less an objective, but more a principle that really cuts across the entire project, which is a focus on working in close partnership with young people and families, because you really cannot be thinking of what will work well uh, for young people and families without making sure that they have a strong voice in terms of shared decision making, peer support, uh, involvement in design of the youth friendly spaces. So these are the five core principles <coughs> that are being implemented across diverse sites. Now, what we, what's really been interesting in this project is that while we have these core principles, we really emphasized local implementation, local innovation, and local ownership. So for instance, one of our first objectives is every site had to do something to increase the number of young people who, who will access services. And this looks very different. So if you're talking about a big site like Edmonton, they might use something like YouTube or social media strategy. But if you're talking about a small <coughs> community, it's actually possible to make sure that every young person in the community knows about the Access Open Mind site. Uh, for some of our indigenous communities, this has meant weaving in activities like hunting and fishing. So the goal is the same. More young people who need mental health services are accessing it. But the way we attain that goal is quite different and it's informed by the context. Uh, what we're also doing in this project is perhaps for the first time really thinking about collecting common sets of data across these 14 sites and the kinds of data that are not only for the purpose of research, which is really, really important, but also that makes sense to these communities. So how can we use the data in real time to inform your care? <coughs> How can we use the data in real time to keep changing the service so that it better meets the needs of young people and families? How can we use this data to answer questions that policymakers and decision makers have? So it's been really an interesting exercise uh, in not sort of implementing mental health research in a nice uh, academic setting within a McGill hospital, which is fun. But there's a whole new set of challenges and opportunities when it comes to implementing evaluation research in real world community and clinical settings. This has also meant, I mean, I feel like in the last few years, my world has expanded and along with that, my world views. Like, so this is our network we have about 200 plus members. Uh, it includes service providers, youth, families, researchers, community organizations, indigenous communities, non-indigenous communities. So it's been an amazing confluence of perspectives from across Canada. Um, I am going to see if I have the time. I might skip this video. It is on our Access Open Minds YouTube channel. Uh, the, the, the video is actually a very short video that shows the kind of creative solutions you come up with when you're working with young people. So this was made by a youth intern who did an internship in communications. She's part of the Youth Council. And she really came up with a really nice video to engage young people to know about access <laughs> services. 
so if we have time, we'll see it. If not, I'll encourage you to show it. Okay. Okay then. Go for it. Wake up, seeing possibilities, nothing's ever easy Life's hard, but I know that I can make it, I know that I can make it with you to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that I've been doing in India. Uh, and before that, just sort of a broader context. So this concern about the mental health of young people is certainly not a concern only in countries like Canada, but it's also a concern in low and middle income countries that are experiencing unprecedented change, that have lots more young people, um, and they have huge resource gaps. So they really have very few specialists or trained psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers. What this has meant is that in addition to huge gaps in treatment, it has also meant some amazing creativity in terms of solutions uh, that have, you know, for instance, solutions have been training lay health workers or community, uh, community members to do a lot of the things that specialists do in high income countries with amazing success great use of technology, a lot more uptake of digital methods uh, to make sure that you can have wider access and wider reach. And there's a lot that we stand to gain. Often the direction of flow of knowledge or exchange has been from the West to the East. I think that there's a lot we can gain by a much more bi-directional flow of knowledge. Uh, and I'm going to just show you a couple of examples of, of that. So this is work a few years ago before we started the Access Open Minds project. We did this project funded by Grand Challenges Canada in Kashmir, India. Uh, so it's a remote area. There was no mental health care in this particular region. Um, it's a conflict-ridden zone of India. For those of you who know, between India and Pakistan, there's always been conflict around this region and who owns what part of the region. There's always been armed, uh, armed forces located here. So it's been, there's been a lot of trauma in this region. So when we went there, there was really no mental health. What we did was we recruited 40 young people from the community, 20 male, 20 female, trained them with a two-week program and with access to support and supervision in identifying and treating uh, major mental disorders. Uh, and we had amazing success in terms of the numbers of young people identified, in terms of the kinds of care, and in terms of the outcomes they experienced. So when we started the Access Open Minds project, <coughs> we had two communities, um, one in the Northwest Territories uh, and another in Nunavik. And what we heard from them was specialists come and they go, there's no continuity of care, this is really not working out. People come once a week. We need something that's a bit more local. We need capacity that will stay within our community. So what we did was that we said, why not use the same method? Why not train two people from the community? So what you see here is a picture of Uluhaktuk in Northwest Territories, Canada, where we actually worked with an elder and a young person. People from the community adapted the program that we had in Kashmir, trained them uh, essentially to identify, to offer services, uh, to work with specialist services when needed. So that's the model that we adopted here. So you can really see that there are some commonalities and there was a really nice sort of flow of knowledge from our Kashmir project to this one. I've also been doing for the last about 10 years or so work uh, in the area of psychosis in Chennai, which is in the south of India, uh, and in Montreal. Looking, so there's been this finding for many, many years 
that the outcomes of psychosis or schizophrenia tend to be better in low and middle income countries compared uh, to high income countries. And while there's been a lot of controversy around it, this certainly seems to be the case for India. So one of the things that we're doing through our research is trying to figure out why that might be the case. And a particular factor that we've been examining is the role of families and family support in contributing to better outcomes. So what we've been doing is really trying to understand, instead of just sort of, sort of talking about you know, like a black box of culture and how it can contribute, really trying to operationalize, what does this really look like? Why might there be more family involvement? What does this additional family involvement really look like? And trying to see if there are lessons that we can learn that can translate across contexts. So for instance, what we've noticed is we've looked at things like to, to what extent families are part of appointments. And so what we find in families in Chennai, India are much more likely to accompany their young family members to care. Uh, they are much more likely to give reminders to take medication. We've also done qualitative research to try and understand a bit better from the perspective of patients, families, uh, and treatment providers. What does the family role look like? And what we found is that across the board, families play a huge role, but there are variations. And some of these variations are certainly because of variations in values, but there are other variations because of the way we see the role of the family. So for instance, here we often see the role of the family as much less important compared to the role of the patient and the role of the treatment team. And in India, that's often not the case where there's a lot more balanced or sharing of responsibility between the family, the patient, and the treatment team. So might there be some lessons here in terms of increasing the role of the family so that young people can experience better outcomes? Um, and does this matter? So this is actually work that Anika, uh, who's here, she's a research track resident who's been doing some amazing work uh, in looking at things like why do some, to what extent do young people complete the treatment that they start and if they drop out, why might they drop out? So what we, what we found here was really, really interesting. So we usually offer care for about two years to young people with psychosis, both here in Montreal and in Chennai, India. And the first thing we noticed was that significantly higher numbers of young people drop out of care before they complete the two-year follow-up in Montreal than in Chennai. So that's, that's pretty disturbing. We want people to get the care for the amount of time that we think is recommended. And what, in this case, what's really interesting is that we found that this difference is nearly entirely explained by the amount of contact between the family and the treatment team. And this is something that can, to some extent, be replicated across contexts. Uh, so part of what I mentioned earlier, so I just wanted to sort of say that a lot of my work isn't really only about identifying factors, but really working in real time to build capacities. Uh, so what you would find on the Access Open Mind site is guides that we've created or resources that we've created that are accessible uh, to multiple people. You can simply download them to understand a little bit better whether it's e-mental health or peer support or early identification. I'm also part of an organization that's funded by the Networks for Centers of Excellence called FRAME. The goal of this is to really make sure that knowledge gets translated in real time to improve practice and policy. Sort of concluding thoughts. So three thoughts that I thought might sort of sum up a little bit of what I tried to talk about today. The first, that globally more needs to be done to <coughs> meet the needs of young people with mental health problems and their families. The second, that improving youth mental health outcomes requires the identification and the context-sensitive application of some core principles. And then the last is that locally and globally, if we were to connect services, stakeholders, and science, I think we can go a long way forward in improving mental health outcomes. Thank you. talk, you uh, had a, a table uh, showing self-harm and suicide combined. But why are they combined and what, what, what is approximate mix? So, uh, 
So actually, the, it has it combined. Yeah, that, that's that's the one. Yeah. Okay. So these are actually only the rates of the rates that I presented are only the rates of suicide. So death by suicide. Uh, what is not represented are what we would call self-harm behaviors or non-suicidal self-injury. And it's really, really hard to estimate those numbers. Uh, also, in all world surveys, often they look at the most proximal cause of death. So sometimes, even though mental health problems might be involved, uh, we would still attribute it to the most proximal cause, like an accident or some sort of risk-taking behavior. But if you did include rates of self-harm or non-suicidal self-injury, the concern about suicide self-harm would be much, much higher than it already is. I'm familiar with the Allen Memorial and, uh, and the Douglas. Mm -hmm. I pass it by quite often. It's a big, big piece of land, hundreds of acres. Absolutely. I never see anybody out there. I mean, you know, you want to have walking exercise, but there's nobody ever out there. So and the Allen Memorial, I remember when I was in graduate school, uh, the, uh, they were testing, uh, you know, the yes. drugs there. Yeah. That's, that's the last time we heard of it. Can, can, uh, is there clinics? Or is there clinics in so these hospitals? You actually raise a very good point. Across, especially in the West, what you would see is a movement, what we call deinstitutionalization. So there was this idea that initially many people were treated in long-term sort of residential institutions. And over time, there is an increasing focus on treating people in communities uh, and so that they are part of life like everyone else, like, and that they're not really experiencing breaks from work, school, family. And so there is a move away from the kind of large institutions, as beautiful as the grounds may be, to more community, to more friendly settings, so that people can have regular lives, just like anyone else having treatment for something else. So there is clearly an emphasis. There's been sometimes issues with deinstitutionalization, but in terms of philosophy, it's one that emphasizes recovery uh, and integration in society. Thank you. Other questions? Mm -hmm. yes. um, yeah. um, so I, I know uh, a bit about Access Open Minds, and I know that you know, many of the sites have been successful in providing a, a youth-friendly space for people to go and get assessed quickly. And what I'd like um, to ask you is, in terms of, of sort of people that are present with you know sort of major mental illnesses, mm -hmm. how does it look in terms of of you know what are the appropriate services available for them? The recommended services for different types of severe mental illness. Mm -hmm. What do you have some experience with that? Like a, Terms so, of the gap. Mm -hmm. so you raise a very important question. So one of the things that is happening with projects like Access Open Minds is we're creating a really easy to access front end where we can assess a number of young people presenting with varied needs uh, for support. Uh, sometimes not even necessarily mental health, but definitely. So it could be mental health, housing. But the idea is how do we make sure that among those young people, those with more complex problems get the kind of care they need? And this might mean different things. Uh, so in one possible scenario would be that the more, comp the more specialized services that they might need in terms of therapy or medication is available through the same setting, so that would be an ideal, where you're co-locating these services either very closely in proximity or some, at least next door to each other, so that's one possibility. Another possibility would be they're in the same neighborhood, but there is no need for referral, so you really accompany the young person and you navigate and you help the young person and family member who might have reached your youth hub to get the kind of care they need without necessarily repeating their story again. In remote <coughs> communities, I think it will really look like a combination of using community health workers who have been shown to offer really good services like case management in combination with telepsychiatry or digital solutions. And we do have an idea of what good care for major mental health problems looks like. What we don't know is what are the best ways to remove the bottlenecks 
that more people, more young people get it very quickly and it might need some really creative solutions in terms of both sort of e-health solutions and in terms of sort of getting away from this focus we have on using super specialized care that might not be feasible for countries like Canada where the populations are very spread out. Uh, so I, I would say that we have some ideas but hopefully in the next few years I have a much more definite answer for you. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. yes. Um, do you think, um, I mean, if, if you're aware, is there any move in Canada for mental health education in either primary or secondary school? Because I find, I find when I uh, had my own issue um, during university, um, it took me a long time for me to even recognize that I had one because I was never taught to understand the signs, what it is? Mm -hmm. so. so there are, there isn't one program across Canada, but there are many initiatives that are focusing on increasing mental health literacy, both among students, but also among teachers, who seem to really, really lack in terms of being able to identify and help uh, young people in their classroom. So there are programs, and many of these programs have shown to have excellent uh, benefits. One program that the Mental Health Commission of Canada does is called the Mental Health First Aid and anyone can sort of enroll in it. There are, there's also some gaps though, so some of these programs are run by community organizations that have a lot of like, uh, sometimes have a lot of good intentions but they're not necessarily matching it with the evidence. So an example would be, we now know for instance if you're trying to get young people uh, and to think about mental health and reduce their stigma. For young people, for some reason, listening to a story, uh, a contact does not, like contact with someone who's experienced mental health treatment does not seem to help in reducing stigma. But intuitively, that makes a lot of sense. So a lot of organizations will do that, but that doesn't seem to work. So what we need is better ways for research that's happening on how best to increase capacity and reduce stigma to be married with these sort of community initiatives that have a lot of passion. And sometimes there's a huge gap, and we need to find ways to bridge that gap. But I do agree with you that we need to start putting that capacity among young people and families. And there's a lot that's happening, uh, but I don't, like we need, I, I don't know to what extent all the efforts are as evidence informed as they ought to be. Yeah. The question, uh, curiosity. There's a dispersion between the, uh, the the mental disturbance in south of India compared to Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. and I was hoping you could point to an etiology for this. That one country, which had gone through a civil war, and has lower uh, cases of of mental disturbance, whereas you say in, in in cities like Chennai and Coimbatore, mm -hmm. it's much higher where it's more peaceful environment. Do you have, do you have an explanation for that? That's, uh, so maybe I'll explain. These are the rates of suicide. When it comes to actual prevalence of mental disorders, mm -hmm. uh, there doesn't seem to be a much higher rate in the South. So these are the rates of suicide or self-harm. That's the first. The rate that I have for Sri Lanka is the national average. It's not the average for the Tamil-speaking parts of the country that oh. did experience civil war and strife where the rates are actually much higher. Um, we also know now that uh, the rates, certainly s conflict and strife increase, but there are some other factors that seem to be increasing the rates. One that increases the rate for suicide and mental health seems to be urbanization. So ur like just being in urban contexts and large migration to urban context and rapid urbanization seems to be a huge risk factor both for suicide and for mental health problems in general, including serious problems like psychosis. And that is happening at a much more unprecedented scale in the south of India or in India than, for instance, in Sri Lanka. So it's a lot, uh, it's a lot more complicated where multiple factors, migration, <coughs> urbanization, conflict, uh, multiple factors, gender, gender-based violence is also much higher in India than in Sri Lanka, which also seems, so India, for instance, is one of the few countries where more females successfully die by suicide than males. 
So it's a combination of multiple factors that perhaps explains this. Extremely uh, interesting. On the issue of population density, density within cities, urban centers in particular, have you done a, a cross correlative analysis in, in different uh, countries, in different uh, regions of the globe, the globe, north, global, south, and seen whether the, whether the correlation holds? To, or have uh, studies been done by other researchers? Mm -hmm. I, I haven't, but I know that there are several factors like urban, rural, uh, the social material deprivation within these um, communities, immigration. So if you're, a, you know, if you're a first generation or second generation immigrant, you have a much higher rate, for example, for uh, risk rate for psychosis than if you're not. We also know that if you're an immigrant but you live in a neighborhood with much with many more immigrants or the same, <coughs> with a higher ethnic density, your risk is lower than if you live, even if you have a higher socioeconomic status, but you live in a neighborhood that's much more white. So there does seem to be a great combination of factors that we broadly call stress. Uh, or, uh, but there, there do seem to be some very important social determinants, which in the past tended to be very underemphasized particularly where we used to think that something like psychosis or schizophrenia is universal, the rates are the same across the globe. We have a much greater appreciation of some of these social determinants of mental health now and then in the past. Thank you very much. Yeah, last question. Um, yes, you referred briefly earlier in your talk to um, relationship with drug use. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could just say something more about that in terms of treatment perhaps mm -hmm. so thank you for raising it and actually i i did underemphasize a little bit often we as uh, subsume a uh, substance use disorders or drug use or substance misuse within mental health but what we do know is that most people do not get integrated treatment so often the services for substance use and the services for mental health tend to be quite separate in terms of structures and in terms of the treatment providers, and this seems to actually result in very poor quality care. Uh, so this is something that, again, uh, the same emphasis on integration needs to be there to integrate mental health and substance use treatment. Uh, we also know that uh, we are trying to understand, so for instance, now Canada has legalized uh, cannabis, and there might be some implications, but the point is we're trying to understand a bit better the connections right. between substance use and mental health. And there might be multiple things going on with one increasing the risk, but one also being self-medication. So we know, for instance, cannabis use increases the risk for psychosis. We also know that those who might have anxiety are much more likely to use cannabis. So some of these relationships need to be teased apart. But the, the biggest thing that we're realizing, at least when it comes to youth mental health, is we do need to find ways to integrate the treatment for mental health and substance use. So actually, thank you for pointing that out, because I did not talk about that much in my talk. Yeah. One we're going to, we're going to uh, stop the choral questions now, and let Dr. Iyer join us for our reception. Uh, before we thank her again, one is never too old to get a loot bag. <laughs> 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 so thank you very much.